uh, here we go. So Gary, would you like to tell us about Captain Moonlight, please? Absolutely, that's why I'm here. Thank you very much, um, Marilyn. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Yes, okay. Yes, thank um, you. I, I, um, I guess I grew up in the 60s, I'm 57 now. And when I was growing up, I guess one of the, um, the regular books that we always had in our bookshelves at home were those almanacs that always came out about Australia's bush rangers. And naturally, you read always about Mad Dog Morgan and you read about Captain Thunderbolt and, of course, naturally, Ned Kelly. There was no escaping him. But there was hardly ever a mention of Captain Moonlight. And I've got a theory about that that I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but... Um, I became quite interested in this story about 10 years ago when someone uh, loaned me a very old book from about uh, 1890s. Uh, it was a first edition, very valuable book, and it had a very large chapter on Moonlight because he knew I'd been interested in the Bush Rangers. And I had a look at it and there was a lot more information in it. So I started digging around and about 18 months ago, I began doing some serious research. I was just finishing the, um, a book about William Buckley and his time with the Wadarung people around the Geelong region. And so I started researching um, Moonlight and I was amazed at what I came across because his story I think is far more interesting and far more dramatic than the stories of any other, the other bush rangers that we had in Australia. And primarily he wasn't really even a bush ranger, to be honest, he was an accidental bush ranger at best. Um, he fell into crime through a variety of circumstances um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context first, because the book essentially is, uh, takes place, or a large part of it takes place in the 1870s. And it was a pretty critical time, not just in Australian history, obviously, but also uh, in world history, because we saw the onset of what is now being called the Second Industrial Revolution. Most of you guys are history buffs or historians, so you know all about that. And it's the, the mid 1870s, you've got uh, a guy with a droopy moustache uh, tink tinkering away in the, at the rear of a small factory in Mannheim in Germany. And he's, he's bunking around with a two-stroke engine that will eventually become the world's first motor car, Carl Benz. Um, in Canada, at the back of a farmhouse, you've got Alexander Graham Bell. He's, he's got a little shed that he calls his dreaming house. And he's mucking around with how to send his voice using electrical pulses and that'll become a telephone obviously uh, and then further south in the united states you have thomas edison entrepreneur uh, well-known inventor he's already shot to fame because he's invented the phonograph which is revolutionizing voice and um, music uh, and he's now mucking around with a long-lasting light bulb uh, and in fact I never knew this until I started doing this work, but I had to look into Edison just to sort of like get a feel for what he was doing. He actually plucked the whisker from a friend's beard, and there were plenty of beards back in those days, and he used it as, uh, as an attempt to make a, a filament for the light bulb to see if it would glow longer. No, naturally, it didn't work. He tried banana skins, and then he finally set it on a, settled on a piece of treated cotton. So you've got all of these incredible changes going on around the world. That light bulb will eventually light up the globe and Earth will be, be able to see the cities from space. Um, you've got the electric telegraph. It's arrived in Australia. And I think I say in the book that, you know, right across central Australia, they look like, you know, crucifixes on the Appian Way. Um, you know, suddenly you've got this language of dots and dashes arriving in Australia, where it used to take six months for the news to arrive from the continent and from, from uh, the mother country. And now it's within hours, they're getting full reports on what's happening in various battles and in various um, uh, events around the world. What this means back in Australia is that the bush rangers are running out of room. You know, they, they've never really lived in a world where there's been mass and almost instant communication by the 1870 standards anyway. So they've always lived on the fringes of society. They go back to about the early 1800s. Uh, most of them early on were escaped convicts who uh, either escaped their, uh, their penal colonies where they were, headed into the bush, and somehow, not for very long because they weren't very good at it, found a way to live off the land and do the occasional raid on various farms and travellers passing by. These later developed into some pretty well-organised gangs, and by the 1850s and 1860s, they were at their peak. And that's when we saw men like, say, Captain Thunderbolt take over the central uh, New South Wales area. Um, 
the, the colonies of Victoria and New South Wales, when it came to law enforcement, weren't very well developed at all. There was no real official police force. Um, and it was the bushrangers and the bushranger threat that actually saw them finally get their act together. And by the 1860s, you had the Felons Apprehension Act coming in, which designated uh, bushrangers as truly outside the law. That's where that outlaw line comes from. And citizens were allowed to shoot them and kill them on site if they'd been declared outlaws under this legislation that had originally been put in, in Victoria, was then copied and refined in the colony of New South Wales. Um, so this is the environment that we're seeing. And that's why I've said that the, the escapades of Captain Moonlight, uh, he was executed in early 1880 in January. Uh, and then Ned Kelly was executed 10 months later in Melbourne. And that essentially put a full stop at the end of the uh, Bushranger era. There are a few you know, little incidents here and there in the next 10 or 20 years, but that was largely the end. And they'd run out of room. They'd always relied on the Bush Telegraph, not the electric telegraph. Now the Bush Telegraph was essentially one man on a tired horse going from town to town, uh, delivering out of date newspapers and journals and mail. Sometimes the news was you know, months and months old, but he'd give them an update as to what was happening in the cities. And it also alert them to the movements of various troopers who were either planning to come to the vicinity or not. So the bush rangers could actually make their escape from the local town, go out into the bush and then divide their time and wait until they left again. Um, I, I sort of wanted to get into some of the mythology around these bush rangers because uh, I, I guess we've had a, over the years, they've been, um, my contention is that Australia the history of white Australia has been so short. Now, you know, the, the first Australians obviously had 100,000 years and they were steeped in a very deep mythology about their past. They had mythic figures. Uh, by the 1860s and 1870s, we didn't have any of those. We didn't have a King Arthur. We didn't have a Beowulf. We didn't have any of the great Greek heroes. You know, we were not even a century old. Uh, and so suddenly you have the, had these I mean, essentially unwashed men living off the land, robbing people and at odds with what was then a fairly loose um, law. And a lot of them were sort of revered. A lot of them had Irish backgrounds. And it's a very critical aspect of the story, particularly with Moonlight and, and with Kelly, because the Irish um, have played an incredible role in the history of this country. And I don't think I really appreciated that much until I began the research into this book. So let's go back to 1845, um, early January, 1845, Northern Ireland, the small town of Rathfreeland. It's a, a small hilltop town. And unlike almost every other bushranger in Australian history, Andrew George Scott was born into wealth and privilege. About six months after he was born, uh, the spores of a uh, pathogen began seeping into the soil in Northern Ireland and right around Ireland for that matter. And it would quickly lead to the Great Famine. And for the next uh, three to four years, right up until about 1850, uh, 1850 uh, millions of Irish would die. Some of them so hungry that they were buried with green stained lips and the remnants of grass in their bellies because they uh, they prayed up to the, the Lord above, but the only thing they could really turn to was below their feet. And they began eating bark, soil, and pastures because they had no milk. <coughs> Make it clear, there was no shortage of food. Absolutely no shortage of food. There was beautiful pastures, lots of beef, cattle, lots of wheat. But the British, they designated most of that fodder to go back to fill the larders back in London. Um, so he was born into this world where around him was this incredible famine taking place. There was a great divide between Catholics and Protestants. His father was the Justice of the Peace and Lord of the local manor. So he presided over lots of uh, small criminal actions and also financial disputes that were happening in the, in the local region. He was often called on to settle a lot of the disputes uh, between Catholic and Protestant groups. Um, so Andrew George Scott had no real idea about famine being born on a dirt floor shack like so many Australian bush rangers had been. Uh, unfortunately, by the 
late 1850s, when he was a teenager, he'd, he'd gone to London, become a Navy with the British, um, <coughs> British Navy, and was actually training on the, uh, the HMS uh, Britannica, which was the training vessel over there. He was called home. The family had lost their fortune. Uh, his father had lost his job because the British government had rezoned the area. And they, were for, they had no alternative but to leave Ireland. And they, uh, New Zealand were then offering uh, 40 quid for people to emigrate to New Zealand, where they were in the midst of you know, the ongoing war with the Maori, what became known as the New Zealand Wars. And so they went over. They got a block of land. I uh, didn't really like that. Um, Andrew George Scott's father, Thomas, um, then became a local justice of the peace again, and then later trained as a reverend over there, where he was um, very well respected. Uh, it was always said that there was a, a little bit of madness that ran in the blood of the Scott family, and it may have missed the father, but I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it certainly landed in his second son. Uh, because on the ship out, the Black Eagle, uh, some of the crew did note that he seemed to be a lovely young gentleman. And then for a couple of days at a time, he'd fly off the handle and he'd be talking to himself and acting uh, what they thought was strange. They had no understanding, obviously, of you know, mental illnesses back then. Anyway, by the time he's 18, Andrew George Scott joins up with the Waikato militia, sees a fair bit of action. There's a, quite a few huge battles there, including a, a massacre of the Maori just outside Waikato. He's badly injured. He receives a couple of bullets, uh, one or two in the legs and one in the shoulder. Uh, the bullet in the leg, the wounds never quite heal and he'll always walk with a bit of a right limp uh, to him. But he's also been educated extremely well. Um, in London and in Northern Ireland, he was trained in the classics. He's a, an incredible public speaker. Um, and he knows all the classic poets from Wordsworth and Coleridge right through. And he can quote large slabs of it just off the top of his head, along with the Bible as well, which will become quite handy for him later in his career. He um, leaves New Zealand. There's a few incidents there. He arrives in Australia in about 1868, about, uh, about four or five weeks after Queen Victoria's second son, Prince Alfred, has arrived in the colonies. He's been on a great tour. Uh, he's been in Victoria. There's been a lot of competition between the colonies. Uh, no, no surprise and no changes there. New South Wales loathed Victoria. Victoria loathed New South Wales. There was always a massive rivalry going on. Uh, and the prince uh, was a notorious womanizer and partier. And uh, at a picnic meeting in Clontarf in North Sydney, uh, an Irishman had gone up behind him and fired three shots. One of them um, landed in his back, but was fortunately partly deflected by the fact that he was wearing very thick braces. Anyway, there was a huge reaction because he was Irish and uh, he was supporting uh, Irish republicanism. Um, the New South Wales Colonial Secretary, Henry Parks, the, the so-called father of um, Federation, um, withdrew funding for a lot of the Catholic schools. There were battles in the streets. Uh, there was a young man shot um, during a, a meeting of uh, Catholics by Protestants in Melbourne. Um, so you've got this sort of this uh, swirling around in the background as Andrew George Scott arrives in Sydney. He goes straight to Melbourne. His family have contacts in the Anglican Church. He meets uh, Bishop Charles Perry, I think his name was, the Archbishop of Melbourne at the time, who was running a, uh, uh, he's run out of men to actually send out into, the, into, the, into Victoria because you've had the gold rush and you've had this spectacular, obviously, rise in the population. And he hasn't had enough preachers to send out to spread the word. So he's run a, a, a system called lay, of lay readers where they're not official preachers and members of the laity, but they're given a license to go out. They're paid hundred pounds a year and they go out and, and give sermons. So he gives Andrew George Scott this dashing, look, young looking, handsome um, Irishman with steel blue eyes. And he sends him to Bacchus Marsh. And thank God I'm talking to Victorians today because I was at a uh, function last night where I had to explain where all of these Victorian country towns were. So I don't need to tell you where Bacchus Marsh was, but it wasn't a very important hub, obviously, on the way to Ballarat. He goes there, he makes a, a, a big name for himself because he's also been trained as a civil engineer in, um, in New Zealand. And so he hangs out his shingle as a civil engineer. He gives public lectures in, ba in Bacchus Marsh. Um, 
a deep for a new dam because there's a drought underway. Um, he has a few problems with some of the locals and he falls in with uh, the, a guy called James Crook, who is the local, um, well, he's called the Lord of the Manor in Bacchus Marsh because he lives in the house of Bacchus Marsh's founder. Um, and he is actually, uh, Andrew George Scott is moved to the small mining town of Mount Edgerton not long after. Um, and people come in from miles away to listen to his sermons. He's a fiery gospeler, um, brilliant on his feet, uh, and with that soft Irish look to his accent, um, he attracts a, a huge and quite loyal audience. He also develops quite intense relationship with a young 19 year old man who is the the clerk at the local bank, the Mount Edgerton Bank. Quite an important bank because all the local miners go there to deposit their nuggets and their, their money and cash them in. And late one night, this young man is uh, uh, closing the bank when he feels a, uh, a gun uh, at the back of his head. And there's an Irish voice. Um, and it turns out there's a man in a mask with a black crepe uh, a mask and a large hat and a cape on. He robs the bank of a thousand pounds in gold and jewelry and, and cash and signed, leaves a note signed, you know, this deed was perpetrated by Captain Moonlight. It's an interesting name because it goes back to the days in Ireland when the white boys, uh, uh, the Republican Irish movement were there um, and they would creep into the English landlord's properties um, at night wearing white robes, a little bit like the KKK in a way, uh, but they'd hamstring the cattle and they'd break fences as a way of getting back against their repressive English overlords. So he called himself Captain Moonlight. Suspicion fell on the young man and he, there was a court hearing and he was charged and he finally got off. Uh, there was suspicion about Andrew George Scott, we'll call him George Scott from now on because everyone called him George. Um, and within weeks, George Scott had left Mount Edgerton and he turns up on a boat heading off to Fiji with a large cake of gold in his luggage. He uh, goes to Fiji, has incredible adventures over there. He rips off a few people. Um, and I should say the reason I think that he robbed the bank and he always denied that he'd done it. But as we'll see in a minute, he, he was sentenced to Pentridge for 10 years for the crime. He was incredibly broke. Um, he'd been on a stipend from the church, which had stopped. Uh, he was also lacking funds from his father in New Zealand and he'd borrowed heavily. And I think he was just desperate for money. And George Scott was a, was a man who had very old fashioned, even for the time, old fashioned notions of honor and dignity. And saving face to him was incredibly important and eventually it would become uh, a key driver in his downfall. Anyway, he, he was in the Pacific for about six or eight months. Um, he managed to come back to Australia. He piloted a, a boat um, and steered it through one of the worst storms Sydney had seen because he had sailing experience. And that's what you do if you're George Scott, you can just about do anything. He then went on a bender essentially for the next nine months, passing forged checks, spending up his money, cashed in the gold nugget at the Royal Mint and picked up 540 pounds for it. Uh, then started running out of money because of this, this bender he was on. He was arrested and charged with forgery and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. He spent various times in the time in the Parramatta Asylum, but they decided that he was shamming, which was a word for feigning illness at that, at that time. On the day he was released, he had in his jacket a, a two page or three page letter to his father in New Zealand, who he now hadn't seen for quite a few years. And he talks about how he's, he thinks he's overcome his problems and he feels a lot better. And quite clearly he has been seized by the, he's either bipolar, there's a, a strong streak of narcissism that runs through him. Um, but he's arrested, he never gets to post the letter. The letter is actually seized by the police who arrest him on the day that he's released from Parramatta Jail. And he's taken to Melbourne and charged with the robbery at Mount Edgerton. And he, uh, just before, he, he's taken to Ballarat. By now, he's a huge name. Uh, Captain Moonlight, it's all in the newspapers. The papers have a, have a lot of fun with it and probably sell a lot more copies with it. Hundreds of people are there at the Ballarat train station to greet him as he arrives. They lock him up in Ballarat jail to prepare for the trial. It's escape proof, this jail. The local, locals in Ballarat are very proud of in their jail. 
Uh, three nights later, he goes over the top, taking six prisoners with him. Uh, because as a civil engineer, he knew how to break the lock on it and he knew a, a good way out. Uh, he's on the run for 10 days, eventually recaptured, taken back put on trial. He defends himself. Sir Redmond Barry is the judge, and he'll be the judge in 10 years later who will sentence Ned Kelly to hang and then will die a fortnight after Kelly is dead. Um, and a very entertaining trial. When you read the transcripts and the reports from the time, Moonlight is brilliant on his feet. He makes these wonderful speeches, alludes to a poetry um, citations. It's incredible. Um, and he annoys everyone because he just keeps talking and talking and talking. He loves an audience. And once he starts, he finds it a little bit like me, very hard to stop. So he uh, is sentenced to prison, uh, to the Pentridge Stockade, as it was known then. For 10 years and he arrives there in 1872. From looking at the dates very carefully when Ned Kelly was there, Ned passed through Pentridge for a few months and then was put on one of the hulks in Port Phillip Bay and down at Williamstown for a time then went back. I'd say their paths would have crossed. There's nothing in the records that suggests they ever met each other. Uh, they probably wouldn't have been uh, the sort of guys you would expect to get along. Very different backgrounds, uh, very different way of talking, uh, very different perspective on life. Um, Moonlight, certainly though, for the next three years, was barely, hardly the model prisoner. He, um, because of his honour, his dignity, he thought this place should be a, a, a prison for reform. Um, and so he was constantly in trouble. Uh, often being sent to solitary confinement for a day here or a week there. In about 1875, he crosses paths with uh, a young man. He's about 23, 24, very boyish looking, got a dimple on the chin, jug ears, uh, very innocent eyes. He's not so innocent. His name is James Nesbitt, and he's been running with the gangs in Bouverie Street in Carlton and elsewhere, one of those inner city um, northern suburbs of Melbourne. His father is James Nesbitt Senior, who's a well-known drunk um, who bashes his wife regularly and his kids. Uh, in fact, the, the newspaper reports the Argus and the Age at the time often covered him, and he was known as the Brute. And they'd often refer to the Brute appeared in court again yesterday and was either sentenced for three months or six months, which was awful, often something his wife would have looked forward to, I think, because she had a break. So James had had it tough. He'd been beaten by the old man for a long time. He was a petty thief himself. And he arrived in Pentridge and he and Moonlight saw something in each other that no one else had seen. And they formed this incredibly tight bond. According to the prison authorities, they were inseparable friends. And there's a very touching note when you look at their prison records um, that uh, says that uh, James Nesbitt uh, was actually docked a day um, and had a day added to his sentence for um, taking tea to a prisoner, Bracket Scott. So uh, he, I think he doted on Scott a fair bit. I think in Scott, uh, James Nesbitt saw a man that he'd never met before or known before. He talked, he was a great speaker. He talked about these notions of dignity and honour, whereas he, all he'd ever known were the knuckles of his father's fist. Um, they just seemed to have a connection and a couple of times the prison authorities um, separated them. Um, and James was only in there for about three years. He was released, but he waited until 1879 when Moonlight was released in, I think, March 1879. And he was there waiting for him. And they had high, high hopes. They were inseparable once they were outside. Uh, one of Moonlight's first tasks when he got out of Pentridge was to go and hire Richard Thatcher, who in Melbourne at the time was quite a prominent theatrical agent. He looked after some of the most well-known actresses on the, on the stage there. Uh, he had experience in uh, the UK. Uh, he, he was a jack of all trades, like a lot of people back then in the, in the entertainment industry. He'd been to Fiji just before uh, Moonlight had been there. He walked in one day and said, oh, I'd like a job as a journalist on the Fiji Times. And, they said, well, there's a five-legged pig that's just been born down at the local market. Go down and do a story on that. Uh, he did, and two days later, he was the editor of the Fiji News. So he was a, he was a bloke who, you know, perhaps like, like some journalists these days, a, a bit of a jack-of-all-trades, but could turn his hand to PR or communications. 
So he set up Moonlight on a public speaking circuit. And these were quite big, obviously, in the 19th century. You didn't have Netflix, you didn't have Stan. You, if you wanted to go out and you couldn't afford to go to the theatre, you'd go to the local town hall or the local pub and you'd pay a penny and someone would be there to give a lecture. And so Moonlight's theme was um, the failure of the uh, reform system and the prison system in Victoria and how it can be fixed. And quite cheekily, he went to Ballarat for his first um, speech. 500 people turned up at the Unicorn Hotel. Uh, the atmosphere was apparently electrical. Uh, you read the Ballarat newspapers at the time, they were all there, they had many reporters that gathered. Uh, people were on the edge of their seat. He spoke for almost two hours. He came out beautifully dressed, uh, this was scented, uh, hair parted, not a whisker out of place, the best suit that he could find. Um, and he held his top down an hour and a half to two hours. But the, the novelty wore off after three or four speeches. He, he moved down to Williamstown. He was also being harassed by the police, and there's no doubt about that. Um, there were the Victorian um, police had come under enormous pressure, obviously, for their failure to capture the Cali gang. Uh, at one stage, they put around a rumour that Moonlight and his group of young men and by then he'd formed quite an attachment to three or four young men, um, were planning to hook up with Ned Kelly and form a super gang that would take on the troopers in northeastern Victoria. Um, it was a, only a rumour, it was started, uh, but he couldn't get a job because everywhere he went, the police told prospective employers that he wasn't going to be up to it. He was the, um, you know, the, the Captain Moonlight they'd read about. So he had James Nesbitt with him. They were staying in a boarding house in Fitzroy and then later in North Melbourne. They also had a young man called Tom Rogan, who was, uh, he'd been to jail a couple of times. He was a boot maker. Uh, he was the only Catholic of the group. Uh, they met a young man at 14 years old called Gus Wernicke, whose father owned one of the big hotels in Spencer Street and also one of the brothels around the corner. And he had found uh, Gus Wernicke on the streets. He was flea ridden and suffering from a skin disease, starving, and he'd been kicked out of home. So he picked him up and looked after him and took him home with him and fed him and, and nursed him back to health. Um, there was another young man called Tom Williams in Ballarat who was completely besotted with bushrangers because they were the celebrities of the day. Um, and so by then, they, he decided, well, I'm going to look after you young men. I am the Captain Moonlight. They referred to him as Captain quite often. <coughs> um, and but they were unlike, they weren't bushrangers. Um, four of them couldn't even ride a horse. None of them, most of them had never used a gun before, although Moonlight always had a gun with him and he always carried it in a holster on their Andy's waist. So they um, headed off on foot. He decided that there was no future in Victoria, uh, that everyone was out to get him, and his reputation always preceded him. So they'd go to New South Wales and try and start again. Um, now, this is at the height of um, uh, the Premier or the, or the Colonial the Secretary at the time was Graham Berry, and uh, they called it, I think, Berry's Recession. Uh, he'd sacked a huge number of public servants and judges. There was a dispute with the, uh, the so what, what we now call the Upper House and the landed gentry who occupied most of the seats. You guys know a lot more about that than, than probably me. Um, anyway, you had hundreds and hundreds of people walking from town to town in country Victoria, looking for work um, and looking for food and handouts. They set off, they um, crossed the Murray River a few weeks later and they were heading towards Gundagai because they'd heard that the Wanta Badgery station there had a fantastic reputation around the country for itinerant travellers. You could arrive there, you could pick up a feed, they might give you a bit of work for a day or a week if you're lucky, cleaning out the stables, uh, and they would give you a small hut um, somewhere on the property where you could sleep and have a roof over your head. Well, they arrived hungry, they'd run into flour, the last of their supplies had gone, and they were rudely knocked back. Uh, the ownership of the station had changed. William Baines was the new general manager. Uh, he was very disdainful and told them in those short terms to get out and go away. So they spent the night in the hills, it started raining, they were drenched, they were starving. They went back the next day and tried again. They were given the same response. By then, uh, uh, Moonlight was under enormous pressure. You know, he had these four or five young men with him and he would promised them that he would get them food, that he'd get them work. Uh, he'd been embarrassed and humiliated. And this was a, a great affront to his sense of self-worth, his sense of dignity and his sense of honour. 
So the next afternoon, they all went down there and while most of the owners and the managers of the station were out, they took control. Um, they bailed them up, um, raided the larder. That was the first thing they did and had a beautiful big meal. Uh, but unfortunately for them, the longer this went on, people started arriving because Wanda Badgery was a real hub for the local community. You know, the pub was down the road, the local business, people came from everywhere. Within 24 hours, 48 hours, they had up to 40 hostages under this roof and Moonlight was beginning to fall apart under the pressure. Um, he staged a mock trial at one stage. He threatened to kill William Baines, the general manager. Now, Baines is an interesting character because a lot of people say to me, well, where is the proof that Moonlight was gay and he was our first or maybe only, I doubt it very much, but uh, most prominent gay bushranger. And there's a moment where Baines has been um, kept prisoner by the bushrangers and uh, he looks at James Nesbitt and he calls him a puff. Now that was slang in the 1870s and 1880s in Australia for a homosexual man. And so you've got that. I'll give you a few more examples of, of what was to come. Um, anyway, they, things go from bad to worse, they deteriorate. Uh, the police from Wagga arrive, they're embarrassed because Moonlight's brilliant with the gun, there's a shootout and he forces them to retreat and leave their horses behind. Um, they're backed up then by the Gundagai police and about a few miles away from Wanda Badgery there's a final showdown at the Bleeds Hut where um, a massive shootout takes place. One of the troopers gets inside the hut and peers through the window into the kitchen and gets a shot away and the bullet goes through James Nesbitt's um, Temple. Moonlight, when he finds out about this, he's already got Gus Wernicke dying out on the ground, the young, now 15 year old young boy. He's been uh, shot in the stomach and the throat. Um, Moonlight rushes into the hut, cradles Nesbitt in his arms. He's got a blood smeared face, and the autopsy report will show that the, the coroner actually explored the, the bullet hole and found fragments of bone and brain coming out. Uh, and he kisses him, kisses him passionately according to several of the troopers who were there and reported it later on. And they all sat around and laughed at him and sneered at him as he was doing this. He was trying to perhaps breathe life back into James, but he was also kissing him passionately and saying goodbye to him. And effectively, Nesbitt died in his arms. Uh, they went to Gundagai where there was a, an inquest, uh, preliminary charges were laid, Moonlight defended himself uh, in front of the judge and was incredibly rude to the judge and all of this was written down by the local reporters at the time in expensive detail because by then it became the biggest story in Australia. It was also being telegraphed around the world. It made the New York Times, it was in all the British newspapers. The colony was incredibly embarrassed. You know, they thought they'd ended the, the reign of the Bush Rangers. Um, Australia is uh, reaching this kind of peculiar um, part of its growth where it's growing up and it's maturing and it wants to really impress London and show that that convict stain of the last 80 or 90 years has been, if not erased, then it has at least sort of um, been rubbed out a little. And to have a, a mob of so-called bushrangers staging a siege for three days, embarrassing their police at one stage, taking 40 hostages was a, an incredible bad look for the authorities. So anyway, he was eventually taken by train with the surviving um, members of his gang. Uh, an incredible journey because it was an overnight to Sydney and there were crowds that gathered in the night at every station as they went from town to town because they'd heard moonlight was coming through. Hundreds of them jam-packed on the platforms. They uh, get to Sydney. There's a very hurried, hurried trial and it's all set up. The, uh, the brother of the former owner of Wanda Badgery Station is actually the judge presiding over the trial. Um, and there's also a law back then that um, if you're in a group of people and someone was murdered, uh, it didn't matter who fired the, shot, the fatal shot. If you were seen to be part of that group or that gang, then you could also be charged with murder. So they were all charged with murder. Moonlight defended himself. He was incredibly tired by the stage. They're all found guilty. It was a sham trial. It was put on very quickly. The judge was not interested in listening to Moonlight at all. Um, and 
it didn't really follow the, the processes of law as we understand them now. But even by standards in uh, 1879, it wasn't really by the book. Um, we know a lot of lawyers, though, because in the final, Murnock was sentenced to die along with Tom Rogan, the young man who hadn't even fired a shot at Quanta Badger. He'd been hiding under a cot in one of the bedrooms at this shack, crying and uh, hoping to avoid any conflict. So uh, they were sentenced to hang on the 20th of January. And in the weeks leading up to the execution, uh, Moonlight sat in his death cell in Darlinghurst Jail and just wrote furiously, day and night. He wrote letters to James Nesbitt's mother. And he said, dear Mrs Nesbitt, I hope you will consider me and regard me as much of a son as James was to you. Uh, I enclose a lock of his hair that I took from him. Um, we promised we would sleep together forever. Uh, the language is incredibly passionate, um, candid. And yes, men back in those days did write to each other and they did declare their love for one another. But I had a long chat with Gary Wotherspoon, the historian, the former historian with the University of New South Wales here, who has done a lot of research into um, the history of you know, gay Australia. And you know, he was always sceptical about whether or not Moonlight was gay, but he says that it's the force of the language. And also when I came across a few other letters that they written to newspapers, which strongly hinted at this so-called relationship between Nesbitt and Moonlight, that you begin to put the pieces together. Um, all of these letters he wrote, they're incredible letters. And as part of the research, I went down to the state archives and, and went through them all. And it makes the hair on your back of your neck really stand up when you actually pick up a piece of paper with white gloves on, of course, and know that the hand of Captain Moonlight and his pen was you know, writing on that 140 years ago. Um, he was exhausted and you can tell when he's getting tired because his beautiful handwriting begins to slant to one side and it begins to weave a little bit drunkenly across the page. Um, but they're fascinating to read. They're all seized by the jail authorities and they were never actually sent. Um, so there's you know, dozens of them there. Um, quite a few others that were sent out were later released to newspapers and so they published quite a few as well. Um, and you get this incredible uh, passion coming through them of his love for James Nesbitt. Uh, they had vowed to sleep with each other for eternity. Uh, they wanted to be buried together in the same grave. He was adamant about that. And it was the key question he kept asking at his trial after he'd been sentenced to death uh, to the justice was, can I please be buried with James Nesbitt in Gundagai? And the judge didn't want to know about it. He said, you can sort that out with other people. I don't, I don't really care. Um, anyway, on the 20th of January, about five or 6,000 people gathered around outside Darlinghurst Jail. And it was there on that morning at about nine o'clock that he shuffled out in irons with Tom Rogan to the gallows. And it was there that you met my favorite character in the book, a guy called Robert Rice Howard, who is otherwise known as Nosy Bob, who was the New South Wales state executioner at the time. Uh, one of the great characters in Australian history, Nosy Bob. He was a driver of a handsome cab. Uh, and he was actually handsome himself. The handsome cab with those small two seat carriages with a horse. And um, the horse one day in the 1860s actually um, lashed out with its rear leg and took off his nose. So he was left with a gaping hole in the middle of his face. Basically. And in the great Australian tradition, he was called Nosy Bob after that. And he couldn't get a job as a cab driver anymore because no one would get in his cab and be seen with this unsightly sort of guy. So he reluctantly became the state executioner when the job became vacant. He was well connected. He often used to take very important people around town. In fact, he'd taken Prince Alfred when he arrived in Australia to a local brothel in Sydney. Um, so he became the hangman. And it's a really interesting time because in 1879, uh, in six months before Moonlight's hanged, there's a young Aboriginal man in Mudgee who's been convicted for the rape of a 60 year old woman on very flimsy evidence. And he's, they've called him Alfred. And Nosy Bob was sent to hang him in Mudgee. And, uh, 10,000 people gathered in the domain in Sydney to protest against the hanging. They said, this has got to stop. You know, um, he's, he's been used as a scapegoat, this young man. The newspapers were quite behind it as the protests as well. And there was a growing movement. It wasn't just a, an echo, I guess now we have Black Lives Matter, um, but we saw the, the seeds of that back then in 1879. 
10,000 people marching through the Sydney streets, carrying candles at night to protest against the government's decision to hang an Aboriginal man, um, which was quite radical for, for the time, for any time really in this country's history, but particularly back then. Anyway, Nosy Bob had to carry out that hanging. Um, he was described as probably more satanic than the, than the, uh, the occupi occupier of Hades himself. Um, he was uh, described as a gorilla. He was reviled all around the colony um, he, because of his, his features and also because he was an executioner. Um, and the executioners in Melbourne were often reviled uh, and held up to contempt as well. Um, I'm looking into a story at the moment about Frederick Deeming uh, around 1892 in Melbourne when all of those land collapses were, were taking place. And uh, the hangman there uh, was a guy who always wore a long fake white beard so that no one could really identify him. They were outcasts of society and Nosy Bob had it twice as bad because of his features as well. If you went to a local pub and drank a beer, the publican would smash the glass and hurl it onto the ground so that no other drinker's lips would dare touch the glass that had been touched by the lips of a, a nosy bob. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's roughly the story of Moonlight. Look, and there's lots more to it, obviously. And I thought I'd just let you know a little bit more about the, the Pentridge stuff. Uh, Marilyn had suggested you might be interested in some of that material and where I came across a lot of it. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of information in the, the Kelly historical uh, collections, I think number five, I haven't got the, the whole list with me. Uh, there's large slabs of moonlight related material there. And obviously you can, it's very easy to access the state archives online and look at Moonlight's prison record and, and James Nesbitt's pr prison record as well. Um, I also relied for me, obviously a lot on the newspapers at the time because the journalism was brilliant very wordy. They were all windbags back in those days, as you know, but beautiful to read. And there was one guy called the Vagabond, who you probably, a lot of you may have heard about. He was a columnist for the Argus. Um, his real name was, um, was uh, uh, John Stanley James. And I think he'd been in Britain, had various career. He'd been in America and married a very rich widow. Who, and he'd been in bank and arrived in Australia and set himself up as a journalist and he called himself Julian Thomas and they gave him a, a big column in the Argus called um, the, the Vagabond and he, he was practicing immersion journalism uh, long before uh, it was ever rediscovered by people like Thomas Wolfe in the 1960s and he would get, break it, get a job in an institution somewhere and he famously went into the, some of the asylums in Kew and wrote devastating critiques about life inside these Victorian government institutions. And quite a few of them resulted in inquiries and commissions and uh, reform. He managed to get into um, uh, Pentridge Stockade and worked as a, a dispenser in the pharmacy there for a, a couple of months. And the, uh, was never said at the time, but I found out it was a, a guard called Henry White. He wrote a book called um, Crime and Criminals, uh, or Reminiscences of the Penal Department in Victoria. And you can read that online. It's in one of those, it's one of those beautiful old books now that's been fully digitized. And he relates there about how he managed to get the Vagabond into Pentridge. And the Vagabond ends up having a massive interview with Moonlight. And he's present when Moonlight holds a knife to the governor's throat at one stage and barricades himself in a very small room. Um, so you, you pick up a lot of his personality, the conversational style, this whole notion of is reinforced with his sense of honour and dignity. Um, the Vagabond's opinion of Moonlight is that he's a fool and is incredibly in love with himself. He's probably right there too. Um, all of this was taking place in Melbourne too, at a time when uh, Melbourne had been shocked and this news had gone around the world when um, Edward Feeney and Charles Marx um, aimed a gun at one another in the Treasury Gardens. I think it was 1872. Uh, it was a shocking crime because these were two men who lived together in a small hotel room in Flinders Street. They were often seen walking arm in arm around the city. Now, don't forget, I mean, the enormously strong sodomy laws back in that day. You've got the prim, Victorian, Victorian era as well. Um, it's truly the love that dare not speak its name. 
And these Charles Feeney and, and Edward Kenny and Charles Marx decided they would suicide together. So they bought a pair of guns, went to a wine bar, got a little bit drunk, and then went to the Treasury Gardens and stood 10 feet apart, named at one another. Unfortunately for them, only one of the guns went off and one of them died. And I always get it confused. I'd have to check the book as to who survived, but the other guy was hanged anyway. And after the incident, they were examined by doctors um, to ascertain the, the extent of their relationship. So with, with Moonlight and the subject of his homosexuality, um, there are several letters that I came across, uh, one that appeared in the Ballarat Courier, uh, another one in the Argus, where the writers talk about their knowledge of the prison system. Um, and they're incredibly wordy, and you've got to read them really slowly because they throw in commas, pauses, and semicolons like darts everywhere. But what they're trying to say, but they can't quite say it, is that inside the prison system, there's a very dark, Cult subculture, where older men move in on younger men. And, you know, um, it's all wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But there's enough of it there. I'm firmly of the opinion when you go through it that he and James Nesbitt had an incredibly um, intense relationship. And there's no doubting that it was what we would now call a gay relationship. Whether or not he was bisexual or homosexual, I'm, I don't know. In, in the last days of his trial in Sydney, a woman arrived from Melbourne, which was called Mary Ames, variously spelled A-M-E-S-S-A-M-E-S-A-M-E-S. -E -E uh, she was supposed to be a beautiful looking 30 year old uh, school teacher from Melbourne, recently widowed with a nine year old boy. And the story got around that she was betrothed to Moonlight and had been waiting for him for some time. Now, the story just doesn't make sense. And my suspicion is that Richard Thatcher, Thatcher, the theatrical agent, either found someone to portray this woman to elicit sympathy for his cause. Uh, because there's no indication at all that he ever had a relationship with a woman. And you would think that a lay reader in a small town like Bacchus Marsh, Ballarat, Mount, Mount Edgerton, had he been you know, officially engaged, engaged or betrothed to a woman, word would be around. That's how towns like that used to work and that's how towns like they, those towns still work these days. Everyone knows everyone else's business. It's not something you can hide. Um, he claimed that um, he had, could not have committed the Mount Edgerton robbery because he was spending the night with a young lady who was a married woman but then he refused to give her name and he contradicted himself in later claims as well. So none of it really made sense. Um, and, I, and I think that the only explanation there, and look, someone said to me the other day, does it really matter anyway? I think it was Philip Adams on, on ABC. And I said, I think it does because what it does, it gives us an insight into the frustrations he was feeling. And he was a, he was a brittle individual who was always on knife's edge and he didn't need much pressure to push him over. Now, if you throw into the mix that he was starving, he was cold, he was embarrassed and ashamed in front of these young men, but then he also was involved in this incredible relationship with a young man, and he couldn't really do much about it in public, um, and if people were sniggering about it behind his back and possibly to, to his face, then I think it all sort of adds up. Um, and it's certainly not just speculative, but I think there was a, a lot of people I spoke to when I was doing research for the book that they all came to the conclusion that um, you know they read the letters and they said we've seen a lot of letters and there's a famous letter when um, Matthew Flinders was involved with George Bass, um, you know the man to first circumnavigate Australia, and they sent letters declaring their love for each other. Now that was an 18th century and not early 19th century thing to do, but Bass's wife was so alarmed by when she came across these letters that she. You know, waved them in his face and said, this is unnatural. You know, what are you two men been doing? So you know, they'd been together for months at sea. So look, that's essentially the, I'm very happy to take any of your questions, um, but that's essentially the, the story of Captain Moonlight. I, it, mind you, trust me, there is a lot more in the book. So I haven't given you the whole book. That's a very short version. It's about 320 pages. And, um, 